you know, there's a vision of tomorrow that pervaded in the 1950s and 60s and a little bit into the 70s. And tomorrow back then looked like this, all right? That, that was tomorrow. And <laughs> no, I was just messing with you. <laughs> like messing with the sound guy, you know, just like, oh, you're scrambling. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, this is what tomorrow was supposed to look like. This is what we all imagined. And not coincidentally, this is the time uh, of the Apollo program. We were on our way to the moon. And something interesting, if you see the film, uh, was it in the shadow of the moon? The moon that the, the film that has all of the moonwalkers commenting on their voyage. There's no narrator. There's no interpretation. It's just their comments. Uh, Alan Bean, one of the Apollo astronauts, noted that as they toured the world, people would come up to him from all nationalities, and they would say, "We did it." They wouldn't say, "You did it." They didn't say, the "United States did it." They said, "We did it." that the achievement of landing on the moon was a shared exercise in what was possible for the human species to imagine for itself. The talk we heard earlier, part of that was what can we imagine? This is what we imagine. And of course, that's not what it looks like today. Today, as envisioned today, I, have, I get images I'm drawing from the United States, but you can get these from other countries, perhaps, although I think the United States is on a kind of death spiral right now. Take a look at this. Yeah, this is just a few years ago. In the middle of New York City, steam pipe exploded. This looks like a war zone. It does not look like a country that led the world for half a century in science and technology. Steam. Do you think we did steam? We can't move steam through a pipe. We've been doing it for 100 years. This explodes. What else? Uh, levees broke in New Orleans. This is famously blamed on a hurricane, a hurricane that was category three in the Gulf of Mexico on landfall. So it was category four, then it dropped to category three on landfall. It had actually passed the city. It was gone. People were just sweeping up some dead branches. Then the levees broke. So the flooding of New Orleans was not the fault of the hurricane. It was the fault of faulty levees. We have, there's a bridge collapsed, Interstate 35 in Minnesota. Like, what country is this? When I was a kid, we used to see film loops of third world countries where their infrastructure was crumbling. And we'd say, oh, well, we're not that. You know, we're, we're, we're the West. We're developed. You know, we've got engineers. That won't happen here. This is in Los Angeles. Trains collided. What? You know, we've had trains for 150 years. We haven't figured this out. People died in these. Disasters. A crane back in New York City, a crane collapsed. A crane. It breaks into a building, people died. What country is this? All right, now we got hurricanes. I've told you guys we got cyclones down here. Uh, here's a hurricane, a hurricane Ike a few years ago, and there's the path entered Texas and went up into Canada. And just so. The best we can do is say, run! You know? So if you look at this, this freeway here, there's a sign that's saying, hurricane forming in the Gulf. Like, that's the most useful information you can give these people. I foresee a day, and what does it take? It takes sort of educated, rationalist, engineer, scientist types in your midst to say, oh, here comes a hurricane. Rather than just tell people to run, you say, well, how can I tap the energy of that hurricane? Maybe you can find a way to, to reach in for that cyclonic energy and have it drive the power needs of the city that the hurricane is about to level. That's a future, I imagine. Not a future that seems to be right around the corner. But if I were to draw a future city, it would be a city that's being driven by the storms that would otherwise destroy it. An oil spill. You know, what? Yeah, I, so, so this, this, is, this is not the tomorrow that anyone was dreaming about in the 60s. And what we're subject to is a profound science illiteracy that worries me greatly. I'm told you have a little gambling area in Melbourne, is that right? Yeah? Is it a little area or a big area? Big area. Okay, we have a whole city, Las Vegas. 
Uh, and I visited Vegas for some TV programs I was filming, and I just felt the urge to tweet. Just, it, it gurgled up within me, and I said, I gotta get it out. So, my first tweet from Las Vegas, and if you're not familiar, Las Vegas is you know, everything, I heard a comedian say this, that's exactly right. Las Vegas is whatever was illegal in your hometown is legal in Las Vegas, okay? <laughs> that's how to characterize what goes on there. And so, here's my first tweet out of Las Vegas. Borders Books at the Vegas airport does not have a science section. Wouldn't want to promote critical thinking before you gamble. <laughs> So then I got, all, I got all deep, right? Our human mind, forged and wired for decision making on the Serengeti, is drawn to Vegas and is helpless there. <laughs> so we, we, we invent ways that exploit the fact that the human mind is not naturally critical. And there's one more here. This should have been enough, but I think I kept going. Leaving Vegas today, a city conceived and designed to exploit the failures of logic in the human mind. Now, what's interesting is I'm a member of the physics community, and the American Physical Society occasionally hold meetings in different cities. They once held it in Vegas, right? It's a huge community, many thousands and thousands of physicists. Back in 1986, this was the headline after the convention. <laughs> The Vegas asked the American Physical Society to never return to their city. <laughs> so, I, so it goes deep. It's just embarrassing. I, I live in Manhattan, and I did, a, I did a survey of Broadway, which is a main artery that goes right up the full length of the, of the county, and I just walked into every building and just asked of the elevator, do you have all floors present and accounted for? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 14! You're missing a 13th floor. That is true for 80% of the buildings in Manhattan. They're all taller than 12 stories, so 80% of them. Now, I'm happy to report that the Hilton Hotel in this very complex does have a 13th floor, okay? So there is hope somewhere in the world, not America, okay? Where's two and three? Yeah, that's a good one. I, 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 you know, I, I was so distracted that, the, that 13 was there, I missed. And, you know, but part of the fear of numbers is, okay, the people who are afraid of the number 13, this is the 21st century, and then there's like perfectly good arithmetic, perfectly good numerals to use when you get below the first floor, right? But you never see that. Well, here, you got G, you got M, you, sometimes you have B and SB and SBB, and that's just kind of weird. And I say to myself, well, what country in the world do we associate with very high-level engineering? Tell me, what country? Germany. Germany, of course, Germany. Germany, so let's go to Germany. In fact, let's go to a history museum in Germany. Not, not a science museum, they got those there too. A history museum, and let's go below the ground floor. And what do you find? Floor negative one, there it is. <laughs> the Germans are not afraid of negative numbers like the rest of us. and they make some of the best cars. If you can't see that, let's get a closer look. There it is, negative one. So here's some, here's, is, you know, what, is it math? Here was a headline. Uh, newspapers' names were held to, actually, why are we even protecting them? I don't know, but here we go, ready? I've changed my views 360 degrees on that issue. <laughs> These are people who are running the country. <laughs> and then I thought about it and I said, either the member of Congress was 
mathematically illiterate. We have a word for that, enumerate. Or maybe he did know his math, and he didn't want to actually say that he didn't change his view. <laughs> so I don't know which of those is better, that he's being mathematically cleverly deceptive, or that he's a mathematical idiot. I, I, don't, I don't know which. But once again, it's, it's, it's not the real story. How about this one? Half the schools in the district are below average. You know, this is a lament, uh, a, 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 a newspaper lament. That's kind of what an average is. It's about half. It's about half. You know? It doesn't have to be exactly half, but about half are going to be below average. They probably meant uh, uh, below standards or below grade level, but they didn't, the, 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 the journalists didn't know the difference, complaining that half are below average. This one's a little more subtle. 80% of airplane crash survivors have studied the locations of the exit doors on takeoff. So you, you read that and you say, I, I, I want to be in that 80%. I'm going to study where the exit doors are. In the seat back pocket where the diagram is. Here's the problem. Suppose 100% of the dead people had studied the locations of the exit doors on takeoff. You would never know because they're dead. So, so, so this is, this is a statistic off of one side of the data and you need the other side of the data to make an informed judgment about how to respond to what it is to stay alive. But people don't know this.